Give me back the courage of the olden chiefs. Let me wrestle with my surroundings. Let me once again, in the days of old, dominate my environment. Let me humbly accept this new culture, and through it rise up and go on. Oh God, like the thunderbird of old, I shall rise out of the sea. I shall grab the white man's success, his education, his skills, and with these new tools. I shall build my race into the proudest segment of your society. And before I follow the great chiefs who have gone before us, O、oh、Canada, I shall see these things come to pass. I shall see our young braves and our chiefs sitting in the house of law and government, ruling and being ruled by the knowledge and freedom of our great land. So shall we shatter the barriers of isolation. And so shall the next hundred years be the greatest, in the proudest, in the proud history of our tribes and our nations. As a chief for over 20 years, the two things I really love doing is creating jobs and making money. And I think every First Nation chief should focus on creating jobs and making money. Things that that is apparent that all of you know much better than I do is you come from nations that that have a tradition of success. These are nations that often, in very hostile environments, supported their people, had viable economies, were able to deal successfully with other nations, sustained elaborate, intricate cultures and languages, engaged in trade. Lines of trade sometimes reaching hundreds upon hundreds of miles. These were successful nations who had mastered the environment, mastered the challenges of survival, and then, of course, something happened. There was the loss of those resources. Colonialism's impact was devastating on those resources. The loss of indigenous governance systems. Indigenous ways of dealing with disputes, indigenous ways of managing the environment, languages, culture—a lot of that was destroyed by the steamroller of colonialism. And instead of indigenous governing systems, what we ended up with was things like the Indian Act, where somebody else told you how to govern yourselves. We call it rebuilding native nations, rebuilding economies, rebuilding a sense of control over the future, rebuilding governing systems, nation building or nation rebuilding, is what is happening more and more in indigenous nations across North America. And what we call the nation building approach to economic development has. A set of characteristics, and we've identified a number of them. But I think the five major pieces of that puzzle are these: the First Nation itself has to be in the driver's seat. The first step on any First Nation is the elected leadership have to make the decisions and not depend on the Department of Indian Affairs or any outside bureaucracy to decide what's best for their people. First Nations people have to decide what's best for them themselves. And not depend or look at, you know, outside bureaucrats or the Department of Indian Affairs to to decide what's what's good for their First Nation. And why is that so important? Well, when you're calling the shots, then you're accountable for the result. Places like Washington D.C. and Ottawa, the governments in those places, they want you to be accountable for what happens on Indigenous lands, but they don't want to give you the decision-making power that goes along with accountability. They want to make the decisions there, while saying, "Well, you're accountable for how it all turns out." 
Well, anybody with much knowledge of public policy will tell you it doesn't work that way. If you're making the decisions, you're accountable for what happens. If you want First Nations to be accountable for what happens, then you've got to give them decision-making power. So the first piece of the nation-building approach is self-determination or jurisdiction. It's moving genuine decision-making power into the hands of First Nations themselves. Now, of course, then the burden shifts to First Nations. If you're going to have decision-making power, you'd better figure out how to govern well. And the second piece of the nation-building approach or nation-rebuilding approach to economic development is capable governance. It's to govern well. And that requires institutional work, meaning things like creating constitutions, passing laws, putting in place organizations that can deliver, managing the politics that sometimes undermine enterprises. All of that has to do with capable governance. Once the band takes over, it's the decision-making authority, the chief and council then have to develop the institutions, develop the bureaucracy, an effective bureaucracy, because every, every good government need, needs a work in bureaucracy that produces results, not just a grant-dependent bureaucracy that just hands in reports on a quarterly basis. The First Nation has to develop an efficient bureaucracy based around business principles, and the uh, chief and council have to be the de facto government and the decision makers, and you gotta make decisions, and you gotta, you, know, you gotta pull the trigger on, you know, what sort of investments the First Nation should, and, you know, what uh, proper feasibility studies get involved with. And the third piece of the nation building approach is something we call cultural match. What does that mean? All it really means is that the institutions of governance, the way you organize, the way you govern yourself, has to resonate with indigenous culture. Well, the Sioux City Band, we're, we're, we're located in the South Okanagan. We're, lo we're located in a wine-growing region, so we're, we're into wineries, we're into growing vineyards, which was our first band-owned business back in 1968. And I believe a lot of the time, the, your land and the region you're from dictate what type of uh, economic development you're going to have. If you're on the coast, you're in the fisheries. If you're in the forestry areas, you're in the forestry because we're in the South Okanagan and we're, we're heavily into tourism as, as well. The people you govern have to believe they're being governed appropriately. And that means that as indigenous nations develop capable governing institutions, capable governing systems, they have to pay attention to how their own people believe authority ought to be organized and exercised. Now, does that give you a free pass to organize any way you want as long as the people say, yeah, we like that? No, because it's also got to work. The world is different today from the way it was 150, 200 years ago. You can't just say, we're going to go back to our traditional governing system. It was developed by those people in those times for the issues they faced. And some of those issues are still here today, but they're new issues. And the fourth piece of the nation-building approach is to be strategic. We see a lot of First Nations governments where government is about sort of band-aids and firefighting and crisis management and every council meeting is about, oh my God, what's today's disaster we got to deal with or where's the pressure coming from or which constituency is threatening to throw us out of office and so forth. It may seem like the decision on the council agenda this afternoon is just about what we're going to do in this program over the next year. But the answer you give to that decision depends on, is this going to get us closer to where we've said we want to be in the long run, or does it get us farther away from that? Should we be in this kind of business or not? Well, is that kind of business going to contribute to what you have said is your long-term goal? If not, why are you doing it? That sort of strategic thinking gives you the criteria by which to think about the stuff that's on your plate now. And what all of this requires, of course, and it's the fifth piece of the nation building approach, is leadership. One of the things I've learned over my 20 some odd years as being a chief is that leaders have to lead. You're elected to lead, 
you've got a mandate, you've got a two-year mandate, three-year mandate, or four-year mandate, and you have to decide within that term what, what you're going to produce and what you're going to accomplish. The nations that we see that have broken away from the pattern of poverty, persistent social dysfunction, the other things that have for so long plagued many indigenous peoples, at some point, some group of people might been a, may have been elected leadership. It might be someone else. Not all leadership is elected. Some group of people said, we aren't going to do it that way anymore. We've had enough. Time for a new way of doing things. Time to stop looking to someone else to solve our problems. Time to stop depending on their money, their grants, their decisions, their policies, their vision of our future. Time instead to figure out what our vision is. Figure out where we're going to get the money that is our money. Figure out how to create a situation in which we don't need anyone's permission to do the things we want to do. That's a kind of leadership that says, let's start a new conversation about development, about governance, about the nation. A conversation that doesn't ask, where's the next federal grant? Why don't they expand the budget? Why don't they give us more money? But instead says, they may owe us all those things, but in the meantime, what are we going to do to create our own future, to create the vision, make the vision real of what we want? And in our experience, nations that have adopted that approach are beginning to build economies that work, beginning to address difficult social problems with success, beginning to do remarkable things for their people. And they're doing it in ways that don't undermine their own cultures, but reinforce them. Reinforce them in part because those people are making decisions for themselves. One of the worst things you can do to a culture is take away from it the power to respond to challenges in its own ways. Reclaiming that power is part of what rebuilding native nations involves. I think we're in the middle of a major transformation across indigenous North America. There's a wind of change blowing through the land. And a lot of that transformation is being accomplished by indigenous nations themselves. And it's taking all kinds of forms, from the sort of thing that's happening up at Campbell River with the cruise ship terminal to what the Asoyas Indian Band is doing with multiple businesses building a destination resort, being involved in its own construction. The other new conversation we've got to have is about what does governance mean? For too long, I think indigenous nations have bought into what I call the boxing ring model of governance. The boxing ring model of governance sees First Nations government as this boxing ring in which various families and factions get in the ring and battle each other for control of the goodies. Who gets to hand out the jobs? Who gets to hand out the money? Who gets to hand out the new houses? It's people fighting over the pie. Well, we've got to rethink that. That's not governance. It doesn't have anything to do with governing. Governing is about putting in place the foundation for the future of the nation. It's about making law. It's about taking care of all the people, the family of families that make up a First Nation. It's about thinking strategically about the future. We need a new conversation about governance that returns it to what governance was in indigenous nations before colonialism started to pull it apart. When governance was about where are we trying to be, where are we trying to go as a people, and how do we get there? It's not fighting over pieces of the pie. It's about how do we make a larger pie together and use that pie to support the future and those who are yet to come. As Aboriginal leaders, we've gotten very good at fighting for Aboriginal title, fighting for Aboriginal rights. In fact, we're always fighting. Now we need to take it to the next level, where we start preparing our communities for development, start preparing our communities to be in charge. What are we going to do with this Aboriginal title and Aboriginal rights? And the way that we do that is through economic development. 
there's a saying that I have that whoever pays the piper calls the tunes. And what that means is that if other levels of government are paying for our governments, are paying for everything that happens in our communities, we're not the ones that are calling the tunes. We're not in control. We're not in charge. And in order for us to be in charge, to be calling the tunes, we need to pay the pipe ourselves. We do that through economic development. We raise our own financing to fund our own governments, and that's when we're in charge. Everybody wants to be part of a winning team. And if you can pull that winning team together, you're going to have people knocking on your door wanting to invest and be part of what you're doing because you are fulfilling the vision that has been set by the community. Our cruise ship project has taken our culture and we're now showcasing our culture for the world to see. Our youth are probably the most prime people that we're, we're putting forward in, in our performances and it gives our youth the pride in our culture, it showcases our culture and with that we're creating economic opportunities for our membership. If every decision must be overcome, then nothing will get done. That's the reality on the reserve. There's always going to be objections. Not everyone's going to paddle in the same direction, but yet that canoe has to move. And as long as you can get a majority of your people paddling in the same way, don't look for 100% consensus. Don't wait around for 100% consensus. As one elder told me before he passed away, nothing's perfect. Don't wait for perfect. And in business, in an opportunity, they move quickly and you have to take advantage of business opportunities. You cannot wait to satisfy every objection.